Uh, Translation social action is a topic which you won't perhaps see as frequently uh, as other topics, particularly in, in research, although it is something that has been uh, buzzing around for some time, uh, but is not, has not been taken up very much by, by academia yet. It's something we've been working on for some time now in the Avanti Research Group, uh, and s there are other authors that we'll discuss now in a second. Obviously, the traditional role of the translator as it was understood originally as being a little outside the communication between our original speaker or text and the target speaker or text has changed considerably over the years so that we now have a greater um, field of communication where the translator intervenes much more actively, perhaps as we were discussing at lunchtime as the intercultural mediator uh, or somebody who's an expert in intercultural communication. We were also discussing this morning the problem of Yahoo uh, and the fact that they used the wrong colors to sell their products and used the wrong symbols, which perhaps the translator may have been able to point out to them, or an intercultural expert would have been able to point out to them to help them to sell their product, besides translating just the text as such. This has obviously led to some quite uh, serious changes, particularly in things like the translation of treaties or of uh, legislation, whereby we've moved away from the translation of texts nowadays towards co-drafting. Uh, of treaties in international organizations with the lawyers present, with the politicians present, with the translators present at the same time. Or, for example, in legislation in Canada is a good example where they're very advanced in this field. Or, for example, even in the creation of ma uh, manuals, instruction manuals, in some areas, particularly in Germany and some of the Scandinavian countries, where companies will uh, bring in the translators from the very beginning and write the different drafts in the different languages at the same time rather than translating from a text. So this has all changed over time to bring about a new role for the translator which not everybody is very certain about yet and there's certainly some debate as to how far the translator or the interpreter can intervene. I know in the interpreting field there's a great deal of debate as to whether translators should restrict themselves to the words or can actually intervene to make explicit information which is implicit or not. Uh, I know Leo Hickey's against this, for example, and there are other uh, authors who do say that this is perhaps more interesting. And in countries like Holland, the Netherlands, uh, they are working on having social mediators into cultural mediators in hospitals, for example. So this has changed to a certain extent. So what is translation and social action? <clears throat> are we really planning to go out and put our political agendas into our translations? No, this is not the idea behind translation and social action at all. Although this is one of the reasons why People are a little wary, perhaps, of this field of research. What do we mean by translation and social action? Why are we talking about the translator intervening? Uh, perhaps more than would be considered correct by many uh, authors in the past. There's an awful lot of previous literature. I'm not going to run you all the way through all of it. But even way back in 1945, when NIDA first suggested that we translated between cultures and not between languages, this idea began to appear on the scene of translation. Uh, Evan Zoha within literature and the polysystem theory also discussed this. Zladeva talked about the fact that we reformulate texts in translation, thereby leading to the possibility of manipulation if required by the initiator. And she was talking particularly about the Soviet Union uh, censorship, censorship within films, for example, subtitling literature as well. Um, there are other authors who have been working more recently on the fact that translated texts become a genre of their own. Uh, Esther Monteau calls it a trans genre, and I know there are certain authors in the Scandinavian countries who discuss unique items, in other words, expressions which appear only in translations. Other authors, such as Kirali, who discuss the social aspect of translation, the self-concept of the translator as well, Venuti with the invisibility or visibility of the translator. Um, Guavanik talks about Bourdieu and the idea of the habitus of the translator as a social agent within social processes when we're translating. And Turi's norms offer us uh, a basis for a social framework there as well of translation. Perhaps more recently, uh, Michaela Wolf from the University of Graz, uh, in her own work and in uh, an edited work that she did in 2006 based on a conference on translation and social action that was held in, in Graz and more recently Pim Schlesinger and Jetmarova have all included articles from various fields which discuss the idea of translation or a sociology of translation. Now from differing points of view either from ideological points of view, um, ideology in translation, questions of ideology in text and how they're translated, literature, censorship, filmmaking, subtitling, 
and to a lesser extent perhaps the sociology of the profession itself which is one of the areas that we are interested in. In other words we're looking at it from uh, so, shall we say a dual perspective of not only translation as part of a social process but also the translators as social agents within that process. Uh, so they're acting on two levels. One is a profession and as a group, although they may not be aware that they form part of this group due to the fact that they often work in isolation, and then also as agents within the social process, as intercultural mediators, as to what they can do in the social processes where they intervene, how far they should go, how far they shouldn't go, what would be licit or illicit in the work that they do. Now, what I'm going to look at are a couple of examples, particularly three examples which have appeared in Spain more recently. Uh, particularly Esther Monzo from the University of Jaume Primero in Castellón carried out a study in 2002 of the translation of contracts between uh, Catalan and English, for example, where she studied official sworn translators who are named by the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Cooperation, as it's now called, in Spain. She began working a lot on the sociology of the profession, but in the end worked more on uh, text genre and on comparisons of texts. But she did carry out a minor survey within the region as to whether or not translators were known, what was an official translator, had people ever heard of them, uh, was the profession actually being projected into society, were people aware of what translators were and what they do. And the results were that, in fact, they were very little, there was very little known about them uh, in general. And she's continued in that vein now. She's also now uh, decided to call this translation inaction, not translation of social action. So she's given it a, a, a new name. Then a study I carried out myself uh, over a period of time uh, where there are results in 2003, 2005, which is still ongoing that we'll look at in a little more detail now as to how we might go about researching translation of social action within the social process. And another more recent study on a minor level, although it's probably going to become a thesis, later on by Molina Gutierrez as well, who's worked uh, in Granada. So what we're looking at then is this dual perspective, researching translation from two points of view. Translators as expert intercultural communicators and the role that they can play in the social processes in which they intervene. In other words, if they see something in the text that they are translating which may lead to social injustice, which may have something to do with social injustice, which may improve the communication, uh, where there are problems in the communication, can they intervene, how can they intervene, which role should they play. Uh, and then also translators as a group as a professional group within society, and that includes networking amongst translators, their relations with clients, with initiators, with the end receivers, and we're discussing this this morning as well in one of the tutorials. Uh, in other words, who receives the translations? Is there any feedback from them? Can this help us to improve our work in the future? And there's been very little done up until now on uh, these possibilities. So. The general objective, and I'll very briefly, I promise not to bore you with a long description of the, of the study, but the idea was to take uh, one element, uh, or one process within society, and to describe and analyze the translation, in this case only of degree certificates, from a socio-translational perspective, in order to analyze the role of the sworn translator, the official translators in Spain, in this social process. Now, obviously, a social process where recognition of academic qualification comes into play. And Spain is notoriously bad at this, particularly with Anglo-Saxon countries whose systems are so diverse that they find it very difficult to look for equivalents uh, for any of the academic qualifications. So this uh, is on varying levels that we'll have a look at now. The basis behind this came from uh, critical discourse analysis. And I looked at models of critical discourse analysis which are normally used only in monolingual texts and normally only within one society. This hadn't been applied really to bilingual situations or intercultural situations where we would be looking at texts from different societies and in different languages and their reception in the other culture, which is something that hadn't been looked at uh, very much either. So I took a model that Fairclough used in 92, whereby he starts from the text because texts represent institutions, the ways in which societies work. Then we look at the discursive practice that surrounds that text, in other words, who produces the texts, who distributes them, and who consumes them. And these social practices that they actually intervene in, in other words, where do these texts play a role in society? And then we look at all of this through the prism of translation to see how, what happens when we take these texts from one society to another, from one culture to another, 
uh, how are they perceived, how are they used, and what would the role be of our translators in this particular social process. So quite complicated uh, in general because it meant working on very different levels and uh, different places at the same time. So the model involved then the study of the social context, first of all, surrounding the production of a given type, text type in two cultures and languages. I initially began with all academic qualifications uh, and eventually found that this was far too wide and worked only on uh, first degrees, so this would be a BA or a BSc from the United Kingdom, uh, and uh, the licenciatura, as it was called then, in Spain. We then study the social context in which the text will also be received in the target culture, not only how they were produced in their own social context, but how they would be received in the target culture. In other words, what are the systems of recognition? What are the requirements of recognition? Spain has actually been fined several times by the European Union for not recognizing enough degrees, uh, often considered protectionism and trying to avoid a flood of foreign employees coming in from other countries, but they are quite stiff on the requirements uh, that they have. Within the uh, ministry in Madrid, what they normally ask us to do is we must apply for the recognition of a degree to a given degree within Spain. Now this is obviously very difficult because content will vary. In the sciences it's less complex and in medicine, nursing, architecture for example, where there are already agreements at the European level. But when we go into particularly humanities or social sciences, the courses are much more diverse and therefore it's much harder as they look subject or module by module and credit by credit to recognize a degree. So therefore it's very difficult for somebody to fulfill the requirements uh, to have their degree fully recognized within Spain. Uh, the study of the context which surrounds and governs translation in Spain means looking at any translation norms, are there any professional uh, indications as to how these texts should be translated and again very little literature, very uh, dispersed what uh, Roberto Mayral refers to as great literature, in other words uh, work in articles, in conferences which have been published, but not a lot of literature that we could find in one place. Uh, considering particularly the profession of the sworn translator, in other words, how to become a sworn translator, an official translator, and who uh, organizes this part of the profession, which is really not organized very much at all. These uh, translators are named by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation in Spain. They originally would take an examination in the Ministry before, and now graduates who fulfill certain requirements and cover certain modules can also be named as sworn translators. And there are currently about 12 or 13 universities that fulfill these requirements in Spain. Again, a great deal of debate as, as to whether the examination is better than fulfilling degree requirements, but uh, also uh, uh, included in all of the study of exactly how one becomes a translator and then where would I go for indications on what to do when I want to translate these texts in particular. Very little information available, not a lot of direction as to what to do for the professional translators, in fact. Then we went about compiling a corpus of complete authentic texts in the two languages, which in Spain is a lot easier because this is all dictated by law, uh, exactly the content and how uh, degree certificates should actually be written. Uh, even the size of the certificate and the size of the name of the king and of the minister are all laid out in great detail. Nevertheless, I still asked all the universities for example texts, which is not very well received very often because they're very worried about uh, somebody falsifying degree certificates. And so it's quite a little bit more complicated to get hold of them than I'd originally uh, thought. And in fact, I found that, for example, in Catalonia, they did not fulfill the legal requirements. They had actually made changes by putting Catalan first and Spanish second in some places, uh, which was not permitted by the law. In the UK, this was obviously much more complex because there is no national uh, limitation or no, there are no national guidelines on how to create a degree certificate. Each university has its own and each of them have different elements that they include within the degree certificates as well. A lot of them were very good at sending uh, sample certificates. Unfortunately, when I asked everybody for this information, at the same time there was a, a, a press release about having caught a ring of people who were falsifying degree certificates in Marbella, which didn't help, uh, but I did manage to get a, a very wide-ranging corpus, uh, and then also begging and borrowing from friends, family, and colleagues also helped to uh, create the corpus. This meant then that we'd analyze the microstructure of the text comprising the corpus to consider the elements that were included, and we might think they would be fairly similar. In fact, they only agree on three main elements, which is the name of the university, the name of the student, and uh, the name of the course that they received. These were the only elements that really agreed, and things like the date. Uh, there were a lot of differences between the two structures, between 
two fairly close countries, or we would think fairly close countries, at least geographically. From that corpus, then, two typical texts were selected, those which most represented the uh, degree certificate in the UK or in Spain, and then I selected a universe of subjects amongst the English official translators, or tra the official translators of English in Spain, which numbered uh, approximately 450 at the time, to ask them to translate a UK document into Spanish and a Spanish document into English, free of charge, of course, because there was not enough funding, as usual, in research to do this, with an authentic brief. So they were asked to actually carry out the translation as if it were a real professional assignment. They were also asked to complete a questionnaire on the translation of these documents, which included information on things like their training, obviously, but also uh, how much time or how, which proportion of their work was actually involved in translating this sort of document, um, whether they translated mainly into one language or the other, whether or not they had any uh, contact with anyone besides the client, did they contact the education authorities, did they contact the ministry that organizes official translation in Spain, had they received any feedback, had they found guidelines, which resources did they use to document themselves. Uh, so there's a lot of very useful information came out of, of all of the questionnaire that I asked them to complete. Then the translated text would be a, uh, have been analyzed to look at the strategies used to translate different elements within the text. Uh, also the data from the question has been analyzed. And then finally the part I'm still working on is the study of the reception of the translated text and their efficacy. In other words, once I have different models of translations, how would these then be used and how would they be received in the UK universities or in the bodies used to recognize degrees in the UK or by the ministry here in Spain. <coughs> Again, this means, uh, it may seem that we would think that we would take one of these texts which seem fairly simple and fairly short and that the, the translations would be quite similar. But there have been quite serious questions which have arisen, for example. Uh, within discourse analysis and a lot of the uh, research done on administrative texts or what, they call, what are called everyday texts which are considered much too mundane for research and not often very exciting by students are in fact the types of texts which can affect people's lives and I think Diane's very aware of this uh, at the moment. Um, how we translate a degree certificate can affect somebody's life. We've had cases of students who are applying for a doctoral course and one official translator has translated a UK degree, which is a BA or a BSc, as a diplomatura, which is a three-year course, or was a three-year course in Spain. This is not sufficient to go on to postgraduate study in Spain, and therefore the student would be rejected by the doctoral course. They took their translation away to another translator, who then translated it as a uh, three-year undergraduate degree, or a first degree in the United Kingdom. The student was then accepted on the doctoral course. So this sort of problem can be very real for the people who are actually involved. It also shows deficiencies in the translator's training sometimes because they are unaware of the fact that the actual recognition of a degree from any country is up to the educational authorities and not them. They cannot decide which level it would be equivalent to. So therefore they were unaware of this, of this requirement as well. This would all lead to the description of current practices, proposals of possible alternatives or guidelines, which may help sworn translators in the future. And this particularly has a lot to do as well with the idea of the translation as, a, as translators as a professional group, because one of the um, questions which came up was that there was a great deal of mistrust from the authorities about translators because the translations they received of the same sorts of text were so varied. They considered that this was uh, not the sort of thing any profession should do, that normally lawyers and doctors and architects have norms as to how to present a report or how to present a particular document, whereas translators provided very varied versions of the same sorts of text. And this led the authorities often to believe that translators were pandying to their clients' whims. And in fact, one of the gentlemen in the ministry, I actually managed to stay at the ministry for two weeks and work with the group who work on recognition of degrees, said, well, all translators lie because they simply put what the client wants. And this is sometimes the case, or certainly clients will sometimes ask you to say this is a pass when it's not a pass, for example, in secondary education documents. But obviously, ethically, translators would, would not do this. So uh, a lot of uh, questions arose from how these documents were translated and the way in which translators could intervene in the social process uh, itself.